Welcome to worship from Schweitzer Church. I'm Pastor Jason, so glad you've joined us today. If this is your first time joining us, a special welcome to you. This is a great place. Schweitzer is a great place to grow in faith, to hear about who Jesus is and what he wants to do in your life. If this is your first time, let us know that you're here. We've got a gift we'd love to send you and please, we invite you, begin exploring who Schweitzer Church is and what God would have for you in this place. Today we're gonna be in our fourth sermon in the series where we're looking at rest, the Sabbath, the gift of Sabbath that God brings to us. We're gonna be in Luke chapter six. If you'd like to grow deeper in your faith, we'd encourage you to take a moment and go to schweitzer.church slash next. You'll find sermon discussion questions and all kinds of other ways where your faith can expand. So glad you're here today. Up next is Stephanie and she's gonna share with us some ways we can be involved with Schweitzer this week. Let's take a listen. Hi, I'm Stephanie. Welcome to Schweitzer. Tonight at 5 p.m. in the Student Center, we'll be hosting a healing prayer service. During this time, we'll be focusing on forgiveness and there'll be a time of worship, time for personal prayer, and also time for anointing. We really look forward to seeing you there. Do you ever wonder how God has wired you? Or maybe you wonder if you're using your gifts to serve in the best way possible. You'll wanna be a part of our Purpose Discovery Workshop. This will be a powerful time of exploring together how God has uniquely wired us to serve in our church and our world. This is happening on March 25th at 10 a.m. and we really want you to be a part of this fantastic workshop. You can find out more information at the Blue Booth or at schweitzer.church. At Schweitzer, we actively support Flourish, a community development corporation that supports our community right here in Springfield. On March 28th from 8 to 2.30, Flourish will be participating in a neighborhood cleanup in the heart of the West Side neighborhood. We would love to see lots of Schweitzer friends turn out to help with this very special event. You can find out more information on our website at schweitzer.church. As you know, Easter is coming and the week of Easter will be full of special events here at Schweitzer. We'll start off on Thursday, April the 6th with a very special Maundy Thursday observance at 6 p.m. Then on April the 7th, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., we'll have our Good Friday experience. And last but not least, on Sunday, April 9th, we'll start off the morning with our traditional services at 9 a.m our modern services at 11 a.m. and a big Easter egg hunt in between. As I'm sure you can imagine, we'll need lots of hands to help us get ready for all of this. So on March 28th at 5.30 in the office, we're hosting an Easter prep party and we'd love for you to come help us. Then on Easter Sunday, we'll need lots of volunteers to serve as ushers, greeters, photographers, and more. You can find out about all of these things at schweitzer.church slash Easter. We are so happy to have you with us this morning. Let's continue with worship. Thanks so much, Stephanie. If you're worshiping live with us today, we'd encourage you to take a moment, say hello to those who are in the chat, uh, wave if you'd like, uh, you know, put a spring flower out there, whatever floats your boat. Um, let's just greet one another. And if you like prayer, there's somebody in the prayer room happy to pray with you. Now let's enter into worship with joy and gladness that Christ has called our name and he's called us to follow him. Let's enter into worship. done 
come to a time of prayer, I'd like to invite you to join me in the prayer that you see on your screen. O oh Christ, you are our rest. Among the possible voices that call out to us, you have called us by name. You've called us to follow and to come aside to a place of rest, to be renewed in our spirits, to be healed in our souls and bodies. We confess that we are prone to live life in a blur of activity running, fretting, stewing. Rest is hard to come by. You, O Christ, have called us by name to enter into your rest. Help us to cast into the hands of the kind, of kind Father our daily grind, to rely on a fresh move of the Spirit to watch over all we care about, to be renewed in delight by your rest, and strengthened in our hands for the work you set before us. Kind Father, hear all of our prayers. And teach us as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. One of the ministries that we have at Schweitzer is called the Healing Prayer Ministry. Today we're going to hear from Mary Augustine, who's one of the leaders in the Healing Prayer Ministry, about 
her own experience and about what's available to the rest of us through the, through the ministry of healing prayer. Hi, I'm Marianne Gustin, and I would just like to share a little bit with you about how I have personally received healing in my life through prayer. I had developed a bulging disc, and for about three months I had been in a lot of pain. Also, it affected my ability to walk. I could walk only maybe 20 or 30 feet, and my legs would get so shaky and weak I'd have to stop it and sit down. So I made a prayer appointment and two prayer ministers met with me. And after I shared with them about what my need was, uh, they just began to pray quietly. And then they told me to also pray and to ask the Holy Spirit if there was anything that might be hindering uh, my healing because I had done all the medical things that they were able to do. and. Um, I still wasn't getting any relief. So I did as they asked, and I was rather surprised because I began to have memories of a very difficult relationship that I had with my mother as a child growing up. And I had just had all these feelings of resentment and anger and bitterness over that. And so as I shared this with them. They just very lovingly led me in some prayers for forgiveness and repentance. And then they prayed a beautiful blessing of love and acceptance over me. And they said, this is probably only the beginning of your healing. <laughs> and they gave me copies of these prayers and said, take these and use them if you need to. Now, I can tell you that day I felt some relief in the brain I had, and I was able to walk better than I had been. But I went on, I did have some physical therapy for my back, but boy, those prayers became therapy for my soul. As I just began to pray through those, and also as an adult and a mother myself, I had much more empathy for some of the things that my mother must have been struggling through. And she had passed away many years before. And um, also I had to face up to the fact of what a difficult child I could be at some time. And I can just tell you this, in about three months, my bulging disc was completely gone. I was able to walk again, but to me, the most valuable part of that whole experience was the restoration of, of the uh, feelings of just great love and appreciation for my mother. And I can just tell you, I look forward to being with her in heaven someday and having the relationship that we were always meant to have. That was fantastic. If you'd like to be involved in the healing prayer ministry, either in learning more about how you can be a part of praying or receiving, take a moment and reach out. The team would love to connect with you. This ministry, like many others, is made possible because of giving that comes from generous hearts, people who've been touched by Christ. Thank you for your generosity and giving. You can give today at Schweitzer.church slash give or by using the church app. So now we turn our minds and attentions, our hearts, to Luke chapter 6, where we hear Jesus teaching and healing on the Sabbath.
Well, welcome today. My name is Spencer, and today is part four of our series called Rest, where we're spending six weeks exploring the biblical teaching of Sabbath. And the Sabbath is, is not so much about what do you do or don't do um, on any given day of the week. What the Sabbath is really about is a, is a way of life that so few people find. Now, most modern American Christians, we've dismissed the Sabbath as being old-fashioned or irrelevant. It's not something we ever really think about or consider, even though it's all over the Bible. I mean, there's almost 200 references to the Sabbath in the Old and New Testaments. It's all over the place. And so I have this uh, wild theory that uh, modern American Christians need to, need to uh, desperately rediscover the Sabbath. Because what we've done instead of, of adapting to the way of life that God has taught us to keep is we've adopted the practice of the world. And, and this has led us into being overscheduled and hectic and hurried and busy. And this comes with consequences of burnout and fatigue and, and distance from God and the people that we love. And what we need is to rediscover a different kind of pace on how to live. And so we're spending these six weeks exploring what the Bible teaches us about the Sabbath. Today, uh, part four, we're going to move to the New Testament. Last three weeks have been the Old Testament. These three weeks are going to be the New Testament because the Sabbath is a New Testament idea as well. And as we go to this today, we're going to be in Luke chapter six, because in Luke chapter six, we see this great, um, these two Sabbath days just laid out side by side, just back to back. And what we're going to see today is how did Jesus treat the Sabbath? Because yeah, he's a good one to learn from. So here's how Jesus treated the Sabbath. Luke chapter six, we're going to start in verse one. Here's what we read. It says, one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands and eat the kernels. I guess this is kind of like a little snack that they're doing. It sounds kind of gross to me, but you know, to each his own. And, and this is worth noting as we read through here, as they go through these grain fields and they're picking these heads of grain, this is something that is specifically allowed according to the Old Testament law. That's called the Torah. That's the first five books of the Bible or the Torah, the Old Testament law. And it's specifically allowed that you can go through your neighbor's field and pick the heads of grain as long as you don't use a sickle. That's, that's the law. So that's specific. It's good to remember that as we read through here that this is allowed by the Old Testament law. Verse two says, some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. Now pay attention to that word unlawful because that word unlawful doesn't mean um, illegal according to the biblical law, the Torah. Rather, this is talking about the, the, the man-made laws because what's happened is that the rabbis um, found these biblical laws, had these biblical laws in the Torah. And in order to, to make sure that they didn't break those rules, those laws, they created other laws to go on top of them. So they've got like the biblical rules and then they created these other rules to go on those rules to make sure you didn't break the first rule. A lot of rules going on here. This is, this is how this worked. And so, um, one of the places that they've created a lot of, a lot of rules around, extra rules around, was the Sabbath in particular. Because you think about what the Bible teaches about the Sabbath. That, that for six days we're to work. And then every single week we're supposed to take a day that is devoted to God to keep it holy, to rest, to do no work. And that's about all that the Bible teaches in terms of, of what we should be doing on the Sabbath. And so, some questions naturally arise. And, and I've had people ask me these questions as we've been going through this series because, okay, if that's what the Bible teaches, that once a week I'm supposed to take a day devoted to God, keep it holy and rest and do no work, well, what does that mean? I mean, how, how do I know I've done that? How do you measure having a day that is holy? What does that, what does that mean? What does it mean to not, to not work? What does it mean to rest? And so we started asking these questions about this. And so the, the rabbis did the same thing and they had these questions that they were asking about what, is these, what do these things mean? And so they, they started to define it. And they really, they spent all of their time defining what is work. And they created all these laws, these rules about, about what work is and what work isn't. And so essentially they had the rule from the Bible. They put more rules on top of it in order to not break the original rule. And all these definitions of what work is. And I think it's interesting. They don't spend any time defining what rest is, but they spend all kinds of time defining what work is. And so the rabbis come up with 39 different categories of what rules uh, define what work is. It's all kinds of things that you can't do on the Sabbath day. So you can't, for instance, you can't uh, prepare food. You better do that the day before. That's, that's work to prepare food. You can only walk like, it's about a half mile, a little over a half a mile that you can, you can walk. And you can't go any further than that because if you go any further than that, then that's, then that's work. You can't um, bundle sticks together. Like, I guess you can gather them, maybe, but you can't bundle sticks together. That's, that's work. And there's just laws and rules that just keep going 
on more and more and more and more like that. And that's, that's what the rabbis did. Now, generally, we call this kind of thinking uh, legalism. Now that's, you're trying to define what things are. It's kind of a legal code that you're trying to, trying to keep. And, and the thing about legalism is that, is that on one hand, it's, it's very attractive, especially if you're a rule follower. I mean, if you're a rule follower, legalism is a great thing because what it does is it gives you clarity. I mean, if you are trying to understand like, okay, what is it that God wants from me? What is, what is in? What is out? What is, what it makes me a good person? What makes me a bad person? What, what is righteous? What is unrighteous? Like legalism can answer those questions. There's lines that are clearly drawn. There's boxes that you can check and it's very, very clear. And so therefore it's very attractive to a lot of people. But the thing about legalism though, is that it always misses the bigger point. Because legalism is never about relationship. It's about performance. It's about what have I done or haven't done. And so while legalism misses the point, there's always, always what happens when you choose a path of legalism is you find yourself uh, dealing with one of two outcomes. On one hand, um, with, with legalism, as you, as you miss the, the relationship uh, that's, that's developed there, on, on one hand, one of the things that, that might come is you start to ask this question with legalism of, Okay, so how, how much can I get away with? That's one of the questions that legalism always leads to. Like, I know here's the rule, but like how close to that rule can I get before I break that rule? So I can't, I can't bundle sticks together, but uh, can I gather them, right? You start to ask those kinds of questions. And as soon as you're asking the question, like how far can I go before I break this law, that you're always missing out on relationship because relationship doesn't ask those kinds of questions. The other thing that legalism does is it, it creates a mindset where we think we're owed something, which again, this is not a relationship kind of mindset. Is there a certain kind of math that comes with legalism where someone will uh, do all the right things and because they did all the right things, they think that now they're owed something by God. Like, I, I did all these things, God should bless me. Um, I, I tithed and I went to church and I volunteered and I treated people well. So why is it now that I have these, these, these challenging situations that I'm facing? That's, that's what legalism works off this math that thinks that I'm owed something when in reality, what God wants from us is relationship, which works off of a totally different, different scenario. And so legalism is just an exercise in missing the point. So the Pharisees, they have this legalism mindset. And so they ask Jesus, why are you doing what is unlawful, that is unlawful according to our rules on the Sabbath? Jesus answers back. I love his answer because he ups the ante here. Listen to what he says, verse three. Jesus answered them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry. I just, I just love this because they ask him a question about their own man-made law and Jesus comes back with not man-made traditions, man-made laws, but with the Bible. Here's the word of God. Have you never read the Bible and what David did? And so we keep reading here, what did David do when he was hungry? Verse four, it says, he entered the house of God and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for the priest to eat and he also gave some to his companion, companions. So Jesus is referencing a story from 1 Samuel where David is on the run, which he happens to, tends to happen to him quite a bit. And they go to the, to the consecrated bread and because David and his companions are, are hungry, they take the bread that's really only supposed to be eaten by the priest. And, and the point is that David and his men are more important than this religious rule. And this leads to verse five. Jesus said to them, the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. And in Mark's version of the same story, Mark says that Jesus also said after this, he said that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, in other words, the Sabbath is meant to benefit us. We are not meant to benefit the Sabbath. It's created for our benefits. Now that's one Sabbath day. Luke immediately goes into another Sabbath day. I don't know if he's just skipping a week and this is the exact next Sabbath day. I don't know. But Luke goes right into another Sabbath day. Verse six. It says, on another Sabbath, Jesus went into the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose, listen, this right hand was shriveled. And that's a telling detail, his right hand. Not his hand, but his, his right hand. Now, in Jesus' day and in, honestly, lots of cultures around the world still today, um, lefties and righties don't have equal opportunity. Because um, in, in Jesus' day and in lots of cultures, this is still a thing in lots of cultures around the world today, 
Uh, the left hand is considered uh, dirty and unclean. Um, and, and, it's, and it's like that because the left hand is used for, I don't know how to say this quite in the right way, but um, it's used for um, personal hygiene. Let's just put it like that. And so if you were to grab something with your left hand or point to someone with your left hand or, or touch someone with your left hand, that's a very, uh, very offensive kind of thing to do. Very, very offensive. You don't want to be touched by someone with their left hand because it's gross and offensive based on what the hand is used for. And so here's this man in the, in the synagogue. His right hand is shriveled, meaning he only has his left hand to use. And you got to think to himself, not only does he have this disability, but also the relationship, the, the embarrassment, the uh, how he must be on the outside as he's always doing this thing that is, that is, um, that is offensive to other people. And, and of course, Jesus has eyes to see people on the outside. And so, and so Jesus sees this man, verse 7, we keep reading here. It says, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking, and he said to the man with a shriveled hand, Get up, stand in front of everyone. So he got up and he stood there. And then Jesus said to them, I ask you which is lawful. And I love that he uses that word here. What is lawful? Not what is right, not what is biblical, not what is God's will, but what is lawful according to your man made rules. What is lawful? What is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it. Now, according to their own rules, their man-made rules, it was lawful to heal on the Sabbath, but only if that was a life-threatening situation, which is just an absolutely absurd uh, rule to make. Like you just you just got to think about that. Like, like yes, it's absolutely right to, to heal, to do this amazing, miraculous thing that's unexplainable, that is this powerful work of God, this demonstration of God's power. But, 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 can you say that to Monday? Or, or you can do it, but, you know, it needs to be a really life-threatening situation and, and a shriveled hand. No one's going to die from a shriveled hand, and so it's unlawful. So Jesus, uh, verse 10, he looked around at them all, and, the, and they said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. So Luke 6 is a, um, a great example of how Jesus treated the Sabbath. And I wanted to come here because you have these two stories back to back where you just see what this is. And one of the first things you learn about how Jesus looks at the Sabbath is that for, for Jesus, the Sabbath isn't just a day off. It's not a day where you just kick back and do nothing and binge watch on Netflix or watch nine hours of the NFL. Like that's, that's not how Jesus treats the Sabbath. For Jesus, the Sabbath is a day to do good. It's a day to help and to serve and to love others. This is what he's using the Sabbath for. Because for, for Jesus, what he's doing is he is proactively uh, keeping the Sabbath day holy. And if the Sabbath day is going to be holy, then one of the things that that's going to mean is that this is a day that I'm going to attend to the things that God really cares about. And what does God care about? Well, God cares about people. And this is what we see here. And so this is why that line from Mark 2 is so important that, that people were not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for people. It's made for our benefit. And this is how you see Jesus living, living this out, that this day exists for, for our benefit, which is why as soon as you make it about rules, what can I do? What can I not do? I mean, you lose sight of the benefit that this brings into our life. Now, I wanted to read from Luke 6 because of this, it's how it's back to back here. But these two Sabbath stories are not the only examples in the Gospels of how Jesus does this kind of thing on the Sabbath. In fact, if you read through the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you are going to see quite a few examples of how Jesus does the, exactly this kind of thing on the Sabbath. In fact, there are seven different times where you see Jesus doing good for people on the Sabbath. We read two of them today in Luke chapter 6, but we could have gone and we could have read about the time that Jesus drives out a demon. That was in Luke chapter 4. Or we could have read about uh, when Jesus heals a crippled woman on the Sabbath. That's in Luke chapter 13. Or we could have read about the time that Jesus heals a man who's got swelling in his body. That's in Luke 14. Or we could have gone uh, to John chapter 5 and read about how Jesus heals the crippled man at the pool. Or we could have gone to John 9 where we read about Jesus healing the man who's blind by spitting in the, in the dirt to make mud and then putting that on his, on his eyes, uh, breaking several Sabbath rules. But he does that on, in John chapter 9. And my point is, if you read the Gospels, there's 
a fair number of times where Jesus um, is breaking these man-made rules in order to do good on the Sabbath. And this is something that he tends to do on a, on a fairly regular basis. And it's even more striking when you consider that Jesus' ministry, his public ministry only lasted three years. You've got seven times that he's doing this. Like the math kind of shows he's doing this kind of thing, maybe not weekly, but you know, a few times a year where these significant times of doing good happen for Jesus on the Sabbath. Now, if you really want to dig at this, I mean, really think about the math here and see this, um, that what you'd see is that Jesus does uh, good on the Sabbath, maybe even more than any other day of the week. So, I mean, the math would show, I mean, just, I'm going to stretch here a little bit on the, on the math, but the math would show that there are, there are 34, that's kind of debatable number, but there's 34 uh, unique miracles that Jesus does in the four Gospels. Now, there's other times where we see, we read that Jesus heals people, like kind of in a, in a general sense, but there's 34, a debatable number, 34 times where, where it's shown that Jesus does this exact miraculous thing. Six of those times happen on the Sabbath. Like, that's a disproportionately high number of times that Jesus does miraculous things on the Sabbath. And you can roll your eyes at the point that I'm making there, because I'm definitely playing loose with math. But, but my point is that there's something about this day that for Jesus becomes a, a day where he he does good. Like there's something about this day that it's not just about kicking back and scrolling through Instagram. There's something about this day that Jesus sees that the point of this day is is to do good. And that makes sense to me, especially when I think about Jesus's life, because I can't help but think that the Sabbath, one of the things it does is it creates space in Jesus's life for him to do good. I mean, think about Jesus's life. Think about what we know about him. I mean, Jesus was a, was a busy guy. He didn't have a lot of spare time. He was traveling from village to village all week long, teaching and preaching and healing people. Uh, Jesus was, was followed by these crowds of people. Um, the fact that the, the healing or the feeding of the 5,000 or the 4,000, both of those happen because these large crowds are, are with him all day long and stretching past the dinner hour. And so Jesus has to take care of them into the evening time because he's, he's given them himself all day long. You read several times in the Gospels how if Jesus wanted to have a time of prayer, he has to like sneak away from the crowds or wake up really early while it's still dark in order to to have time to do this. There's this this one time that there's these people who wanted Jesus uh, to to bring their friend to Jesus, but there's so many people around him that they have to bring their, their friend on a stretcher. And then the only way to get to him is to cut a hole in the roof and lower him through by ropes because there's so many people who want to be with Jesus. And as he goes down the roads, there's people yelling at him from the roadside, trying to get his attention to bring healing. And there's important people who are always wanting to meet with him, like Nicodemus wants to meet with him late at night. And there's just a, a thing after thing after thing in his life. And so when you look at the life of Jesus, you know, his, his life is, is busy. It's full. It's, it's, it's being used. I mean, it's, there's not a lot of spare time. And so when I think about all of that, it makes sense that Jesus does so many miraculous good things on the Sabbath because there's something about the Sabbath that creates space for this to happen. I mean, the Sabbath is a day that's unlike other days. It's a, it's a day where, where there's no work. It's a day for resting. It's a day for, for holiness. It's a day for setting things aside where, where it's unstructured. And that kind of day, it opens up opportunities to do good. I mean, this is what we see with Jesus. And that right there might be one of the biggest benefits of the Sabbath is that it creates space in our lives to do good, which is what we see happening with Jesus. A good word for that space that we sometimes use in church is we, we describe that space that gets freed up as, as margin. In the Old Testament, there was this, um, this law that when you harvest your fields, you weren't supposed to harvest it a second time, like a second glean. And uh, you weren't supposed to harvest it all the way to the edges. You're supposed to leave some room at the edges. And the reason for that was so that after you went through and harvested everything for yourself, there was still enough uh, leftover to, to take care of the poor, that the poor could come through and, and they could pick. And this is what it was with the Old Testament law. They could pick with their hands and they didn't have, couldn't sickle it, but they could, they could harvest things for themselves. And, and so as, if you, though, if you did a second glean or a third glean and went all the way to the edges of your field, then you had... You had no, no margin for anyone else in your life. This is the principle of margin that we see in the Bible. It's a, and it's a principle that's still very, very applicable today. And I don't mean about farming because I don't, I don't have a garden, but this is definitely a principle that, that we should be thinking about in our lives because 
Lots of us, lots and lots and lots and lots of us, we live our lives with no margin. It's like we go over the the fields of our lives a second time, a third time, a fourth time. We go all the way to the edges and we just, we max ourselves out. And we can do this in all kinds of all kinds of ways, but when we max ourselves out, what we find is we have no capacity at that point for anyone else. We have no capacity for good. We have no capacity to to seek after God. We lose capacity to connect with our families. We just, we lose capacity for other people. And this happens in in all kinds of ways. I mean, if you, if you stretch yourself to the, to the max, you max yourself out financially, you have no room to give to God for his purposes or people. If you max yourself out emotionally, you find yourself um, so stressed, you have nothing left to give emotionally for anyone else who might have concerns or needs, and you just find yourself irritable and burnt out. For me, one of the things is, is I can easily max myself out with my time where I don't have another second in the day to tend to the things that, that might come up in my life. And what I've learned is that I can have all the best intentions in the world, but if I, if I, I might have intentions to help people, to do good, to, 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 uh, be present with people, to spe- spend meaningful time with my family, to, to seek after God. I have all the best intentions in the world, but if I don't have margin, then my best intentions don't matter because I've maxed myself out. I have to figure out these ways of creating margin in my life so that there's space to tend to the things that, 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 I, that I need to tend to. John Mark Comer wrote this book, this great book I read last year. It was called The uh, Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Just the title grabbed my attention. And in this book, um, John Mark Comer, he talks about the, the, the speed that a lot of us live with today. You know, where we're going from thing to thing to thing to thing. And every evening, there's a different event that we have to go to. Every weekend, there's a soccer tournament. You know, we just don't have the, the time to, to give to people. And when we do have downtime, we, we're on our phones just scrolling mindlessly through, through different apps. And so um, John Mark Comer, he, he writes that this pace of life that we're learning from the world of just go, 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 go. This is not a pace of life that is congruent with the way of following Jesus. Let me read to you what he writes here. I think this is really, really fascinating, really convicting, uh, really wise. But this is what Comer writes. He says, this new speed of life isn't Christian. It's antichrist. I'm going to read that again. That first sentence is so good. This new speed of life isn't Christian. It's antichrist. Think about it. What has the highest value in Christ's kingdom economy? Easy, love. Jesus made that crystal clear. He said the the greatest commandment in all of the Torah was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, followed only by love your neighbor as yourself. But love is painfully time-consuming. All parents know this as do all lovers and most long-term friends. And then this last line, so good, hurry and love are incompatible. And this is true, of course. I mean, I think about how my worst moments as a person, whether as a husband, as a friend, as a parent, as a pastor, as a, as a Christian, my worst moments as a, as a person come when I'm, when I'm hurried and I'm stressed and I'm behind the ball. I mean, that's when I find myself being irritable and critical and, and, and uh, I feel myself being short with people, even the people I love the most, like my worst moments uh, as a person come when I'm, when I'm living like this because hurry and love are incompatible. But this is the way of Jesus, is the way of love. But if I live according to the patterns and the pace of this world, what I'm gonna find is that I'm gonna not ever have margin. I'm just gonna be living my life fully maxed out that I have no space to give to anyone else. And, And to me, this right here might be one of the greatest benefits of the Sabbath. Because here's a day that every week I'm going to stop. I'm going to live my life six days. I'm going to work. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to be industrious. I'm going to try to get things done. But then comes this day where I'm going to stop. I'm going to rest. I'm going to worship. I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend time with the people in my life who matter the most. I'm gonna recover, I'm gonna recharge. I'm not gonna spend my day going and trying to get more things done, checking chores off and trying to you know, go through the list so that I can go back on Monday and just try to do even more. And Sunday just some, kind of ends up sometimes being a prep for Monday, but, but no, I'm gonna have a day where I stop. And as I stop and as I take a breath and as I rest and I'm intentional about this, one of the things I'm doing is I am building margin back into my life 
that I now have capacity to do things I didn't have before. If I live my life as the world would tell me and just go, 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 and I find myself disconnected from people, disconnected from God, always trying to get things done, then, then I have no capacity. But when I start to practice Sabbath, I begin to find this rhythm of work and rest, work and rest, and what I'm doing is I'm building margin back into my life. This brings me back to my wild theory that's been guiding this series, that modern American Christians desperately need to rediscover the Sabbath. We desperately need to rediscover the Sabbath. Because I'm going to go out on a limb here and I'm going to say this, that if you were to begin taking the Sabbath seriously, that you would have a day every week where you worshiped, you rested, you, you followed the biblical teaching of, of taking care of, of this to find rest and restoration in yourself, to connect with other people, and you made a day that was about worship, it was about God, it was about relationships, I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say this. I bet what you're going to see happen is that your capacity for doing good in the rest of your life is going to grow. Your capacity to connect with people, your capacity to find meaning, your capacity to have a purposeful life that makes a difference in the world, it's going to grow. Because what you've done is you've built in margin. Now the converse of that, what you could try to do is just live your life continually hurried. But listen, I'm going to tell you this. Hurry and love are incompatible. Let's pray together. And so, Father, today we look at Jesus, what he does to keep this day holy. And uh, we want to live like him. Our Savior who gave himself for us, who had space and life to, to give of himself to, to, to so many people. Uh, he made space on the Sabbath. And so, Lord, I, I pray you might speak into our hearts about the, our own paces that we're living these days. Maybe we find ourselves overstretched, overcommitted. We find ourselves doing things every night of the week and every weekend of the year. And, and you're, just, you're calling us to find a different pace where we can live our lives, not frenetically, not hurried, not busy, but instead in a pace of life that leads to us doing good. There are people in our life that you want us to connect with. There are goals that you want us to achieve. There are things you want us to lead, to live after. There, there's yourself that you want us to seek after. And so, Father, would you speak into our lives, convict us, about our need to build margin. Would you build some specific ways in our minds and our hearts that we could begin to think about what Sabbath would look like for me? What does it look like for me to take this day seriously? This teaching that is in the Bible over almost 200 times, would you speak to us about this? We wanna find you and find life and find the life that you have for us because that's what we find in Jesus. I pray for anyone who's with us today and doesn't know the life that we find in Jesus, the purpose and the grace we have in him. With a simple prayer, we just open our hearts to you and we say, Lord Jesus, would you forgive me my sin? Would you lead my life? Lord, we love you and we thank you. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray today. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this week. I hope you were encouraged and challenged to enter into the rest that God has for us because we are all at a place where we need this gift from God. A big thank you to all those who helped produce our worship today, to those who contributed, to, to our worship team, to Stephanie, to the people behind the scenes, to Sp Pastor Spencer for that great message. Thank you to everyone. If you found this, this worship experience meaningful, we encourage you to take a moment and share it with others through social media or like it if you're watching on YouTube. Love those likes and shares. Thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you next week as we, as we have week five of the sermon series on rest. Have a blessed week in the Lord. Amen. Were creation suddenly articulate? With a thousand tongues to lift one cry Then north and south and east to west We'd hear Christ be magnified And were the whole earth echoing his eminence his name would 
birds from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops, we hear Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise, Christ be magnified in me. And oh, Christ be magnified on the altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. When every creature Finds its inmost melody And every human heart is laid in pride In the world and rapture Hear the praise We hear Christ be magnified Oh, Christ be magnified Puts me in the fire. I rejoice because you're there too. And I won't be formed by feelings. I hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Because death is just the doorway into resurrection life. If I join you in your sufferings, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, oh, my heart will still be singing and my song will be the same. Yeah. 